All right. Let's take our Bibles out and we'll go to Colossians chapter 3 again. I'm not going to cover the three verses tonight, but they are power packed. So uh, just put your seatbelt on and let's see what we can do with these three uh, little verses that we're going to do with three or twelve, three or four, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Yeah, three. Um, <clears throat> last week we talked about to put off and put on. Remember, back in verse eight it says, "But now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication." Remember, we went through all that. Lie not one to another, and then put on the new man. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about that. And uh, Now we come down to verse 12, watch. Now we're going to put on some more, amen? What are the garments that we're putting on? These are, these are the garments of a successful Christian. Notice this, it says, verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. I want to spend just a minute talking to you about uh, something that I've dealt with before. And I want you to get a clear understanding. I'm going to give you, a, it's kind of a brief theological look at uh, a couple of things that people look at. We want to talk about Calvinism. Now, you say, well, I'm not even sure what Calvinism is. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If you're not a Calvinist, then the Calvinist will tell you you're Arminian. You say, well, I'm, not, I'm Texan. Amen. That's what I tell you. I'm Texan. Don't put me. But uh, they put you in what they call the Arminian camp. I would say that I would be called a provisionist. And I'm going to explain all three of those so that you have a clear understanding. I think it won't be a clear understanding, but you'll have a good understanding of what each one means. Calvinists, when you speak of election... The elect of God, that's why I'm going to go off on this, is because he mentions this here. I want to talk about the election. Now, the election that, that uh, Paul is talking about here, he's speaking of the election. We know the election of those who are part of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, this would be, they are, it's a national election. They are, they are elected as part of the Jewish community. And being Jewish, they are a part of God's people. It's a national gathering. It's a national calling. It's a national. And when I say election, I'm talking about a calling of the people. When we come to the New Testament, we find election here, and we're talking about a spiritual election. It's where we get saved, and we become a part of the, the kingdom of God. And, uh, but there is a thing in the Bible called election. And predestination. And uh, we, we don't need to be afraid of those terms. We just need to understand them. The Calvinists take this thing and they just take it just way too far. And uh, they have a little thing, if you'll think of it. It's, it's the five points of, of Calvinism is, is TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. T, and I'm going to go through each one of these. T is total depravity. Now, I believe in the depravity of man. You're so, we're so depraved that we cannot save ourselves. We have sinned. Everybody has sinned. That's the depravity of man. But Calvinists carry it to the next level. You're so depraved you can't even think about getting saved. You can't even consider being saved. They, they believe that man, they, man is so depraved that man would never seek God on his own. Never. But see, I have just one single verse of Scripture that kind of blows that out of the water. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 says, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Boy, I don't know how you can get around that. You know? There's a, there's a, there, I, I think God places in us that desire. When you read Romans chapter 1, he speaks about how he's, exp, he's given himself, he's exposed himself to all men. And uh, so that men are without excuse. Well, that means that they had to have had something in them that would have made them at least have a God consciousness about them. Maybe as only children. Maybe, I don't know. But they should have had something. But they believe that they're so depraved that they would not ever seek God on their own. See, I have a problem with that. So total, total depravity, although I believe the depravity of man, 
not total depravity. Then, uh, they, that's T, U is unconditional election. That means God's choice is made completely of himself. Man's faith or trust have nothing to do with salvation. God makes the choice. If you go to heaven, it's because God chose you to go to heaven. If you go to hell, it's because God chose you to go to hell. Yeah, see, you don't like that part, do we? I, I don't either. They don't either. They, they get in your face about that one. But that's what they say. And so, uh, but that's not true. Because, again, God's word says, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of God, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, wait, through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. It's got a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a God part, there's a man part. The sanctification comes from God, the belief comes from man. And you have, to have, you have to have both. Now, here's the problem, and, and I understand the problem. We can't, as humans, our human brain can't put this together. How can God choose us, and yet God, can, God lets us have our free will? How can you put those two together? You can't. It's just God, it's the thing God did. It's the way God set it up. I don't have a problem with it, though. It's wonderful. And I, I think I have a handle on how he does it, and I'll explain that as we get a little further. So we have total depravity, unconditional election. Now, the L is the part, I'm going to tell you, I can maybe go along with some of this, but this one blow. I tell them right, right quick, when they tell me they're Calvinist, I'm going to tell them right now, I'm going to say, you know what? You and I may agree on one or two points, but I'm going to tell you there's one in there I will never agree on, and that's limited atonement. So what they say in limited atonement is Jesus only died for those who would be saved. He didn't die for everybody. He only died for those who'd be saved. Those that God had chosen. That's the only ones he died for. And their argument is, well, if he died for everybody, then everybody would be saved. No, because you have to get man's choice in there. And that's where they get confused. God said in 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation to Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, the Bible's just pretty clear, isn't it? It amazes me how that they can't seem to, and you say, well, if the Bible's that clear, how come they have such a problem? Because they, because they have a, mm, they have a theology that they want to prove, and they will find a way to prove it, and that's literally what happens, and they, yeah, yeah that's right, they, uh, but they, they, they they'll, they'll, and, and you catch them on a verse like this. Well, now, Brother Jim, now, wait a minute. You haven't studied the original language, have you? You know, the original language here actually says, and they'll put an extra word in there or something. They'll add something to it. And if that doesn't prove it, then what will happen is they want to say, well, now, Brother Jim, did you read any of the early church fathers? N no. Well, Polycarp, if you ever read Polycarp, you'd find that he says, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, good for him. But I'm Jim Newton. I'm reading from my Bible, and I don't find it. And I can just tell you that's all I need to know. I have one of the biggest problems. I have one of the biggest problems with because I say, if you will just take the Bible only, don't put anything else, just let's take the Bible for what it says, the, the English Bible, let's just take it. I believe God preserves his word. I said, I just think you, you're going to have a hard time proving your theology. It just doesn't fit. I had one, I, I share with this, I had one uh, kid who was just after me and wouldn't, was relentless about it. Finally, I said, let me tell you something. You need to understand something. When God was choosing, when God was electing, when God was predestining, he predestined me to be a non-Calvinist. <laughs> That's all I can say. And that was all he could say. He couldn't say anything else about that. But limited atonement, just, I'm just, I get mad when they tell me that one. I just, don't you tell me my Jesus didn't die for everybody. He died for everybody. Right. And uh, it's by man's choice whether you choose. But no man's going to go to hell because Jesus didn't die for him. Right. They're going to go to hell because Jesus did die for him and they refused that gift. So we have T-U-L, I is irresistible grace. Chosen men cannot say no to God's grace. So there's no free will 
for man, when God offers grace, you have to take it. If that be the case, then why would Adam and Eve been given the choice or the chance to eat or not eat the forbidden fruit? Because God gave them a choice. Did he know what they were going to do? Yeah. His foreknowledge, he knew exactly what they were going to do, but they still had to make the choice. Why would the great leader Joshua make this statement? And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day who you will serve. Whether the gods of your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He gives, he, choose, 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 choose. We find it throughout scripture, choose. So we have T-U-L-I-P. Now P is perseverance of the saints. I probably don't have a problem with that one because that means if you're saved, you're saved. That's basically what it means, the perseverance of the saints. Uh, chosen men are eternally saved, and uh, I agree with that. That's true. Uh, chosen, uh, let me just go on. Biblical election is based, and hear this, on the foreknowledge of God. Now, this is where I begin to understand how this works. It, it, two places I'm going to read to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 30 says, For whom he did foreknow. It's the, it precursors everything else. For whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, they he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. But it's by his foreknowledge. So now then, when I get a handle on that foreknowledge, all of a sudden I've got to throw that word in there because they want to leave that word out, but that's in there. Everything he does is based on what he knows is going to happen. His foreknowledge. Let me read another verse and I'm going to try to explain it. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2 says, Elect us. Elect according to what? The foreknowledge of God the Father. How? Through the sanctification of the Spirit, under the obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. According to the foreknowledge. So, I love... Uh, Hayward, Hayward, I, gave, I was, we was talking about eternity one time, and he said, you know, we think about eternity the wrong way. Eternity is not time, it's a place. He said, think about it as a place. He said, God sits on top of eternity. It's a place. So he's on top of past, present, future, all at the same time. I mean, when he's, when he's sitting in the future, looking at the rapture, he can also sit at time of creation. He can be in both places at the same time because it's a place, not a time. For us as humans, it's a time. You know, it has a beginning and an end, at first and last. I mean, we, we have a hard time thinking about eternity. You know, that's where we, you know, a little kid will come up to you and say, where did God come from? Well, he's always been. What do you mean always? Well, he's been here for eternity. Well, explain that to me. Yeah, well, brain stops, doesn't it? Because everything we know begins and ends. But God doesn't. He's always been, always will be. I just, hello. All right. So anyway, so God, in his foreknowledge, so here we are, before he created anything, it says that Jesus was a, the lamb slain before the foundation, or before God ever created anything, this, the, Jesus was already on the cross. How could that be? Because God sits over eternity. He could, he could come to the place where Jesus was going to be on the cross and be there at the same time that he's beginning the creation. Again, see, our brains just can't go that way. But that's exactly what it is. And so whenever he's sitting in that time, he also knows every person that will be created. Before he ever created the first thing, he knew you by name. He'd already designed your DNA. He knew exactly what you were going to be like. He knew. He knew everything. He could come up here. He could come up here to 19, or for me, he could come up here to 1968 or, no, whatever time it was. 1961. He could come up to 1961 and say, ah, look at there. That's the day I'm going to give Jim the opportunity to be saved. <laughs> look at there. He got saved. He actually accepted my salvation. Now he goes back to eternity past, and he says, in the future, I'm predestined. He's predestined to be saved because I know he's going to accept 
what I've had planned for him. And so in his foreknowledge, he's predestined me to be saved. Are you with me? That's cool, isn't it? And let me tell you something else. This makes my God so, my God, sovereignty. Calvinists love the word sovereignty. Oh, sovereignty. Sovereignty. Sovereignty means God's over everything. My understanding of God's sovereignty, I think, exceeds theirs. Their sovereignty stops with God's ability to save everybody and then give man a chance to make that choice. They stop there. We, don't, we can't give man that opportunity because man's not good enough to make that come. Well, no, he's not good enough. Nobody's good enough. My idea of sovereignty is my God knows beforehand what I'll do, and in that he chooses me before. That's some real sovereignty. I, I just think it's kind of cool when you get to thinking about it, how it all fits together. Yeah, he chose me. I'm so glad he chose me. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad I'm one of the elect. I'm glad I was predestined to be a child of God. But I'm glad also that God did it all for me so that when it came time for me to be saved, all I had to do was receive it. I didn't save me. I had nothing to do with salvation. What's that? Yep. Yep. It's all by his sovereignty. He, he controls, he, he moves everybody around, gets them right in the place. He knows exactly. Uh, I tell you when, you, have a, when you have a God moment like that, it's, it's overwhelming, isn't it? When, you, when you, all of a sudden you're in the middle of something, you go, now think about what God had to do to get me here to get this part done. You know, it's, you just go, it's overwhelming. God's so good like that. I'm, we're, we are blessed to be elected. We're blessed to be predestined. We're blessed to be chosen. But understand, you're chosen... What they call me is a provisionist. That's why they say, you're an Arminian. Arminian believes you have to get there by your works. So see, they say it's all by grace, which it is. They are, so if you don't accept their, their theology, you've got to be Arminian, which means it's all by your works. You've got to do what works. Well, no, I don't do that. I don't do that, and I don't believe the way they do. So what am I? I'm a provisionist. God provides. I accept. It's just that simple. I don't have anything to do with my salvation other than receiving what God's already done. That's all. It's just that simple. We are elected. All right, now then, let's get on back to our text and see if we can cover this. He calls us holy. We're called holy by God. Through the Scripture, we're called holy. What holiness can you produce that God would deem honorable? Thank you. Absolutely nothing. You can squirm up every bit of quote-unquote holiness that you might want to produce. But let me tell you, the minute you try to produce it, guess who did it? You did. That means it's self-righteousness. And God says that stinks. Amen? Right. You can't produce one bit of holiness. That's why we've got to have God's holiness. And aren't you glad he provides it? This is provisionism. He provides it for us. He provides that holiness. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he hath made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness or the holiness in him. That's how we have holiness. That's how God sees us as holy. It's through Jesus. That's how he does. It's not through us. We have no ability to produce any holiness. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. It's all through him. It's his holiness that he wants to see. And then he calls us the beloved, the loved of God, beloved. I love uh, J. Vernon McGee. How many of you, anybody here grow up on J. Vernon McGee like I did? You remember how he used to say, now my beloved. I, anytime he'd say that, you knew it was J. Vernon. My beloved. Well, here it's used in the scripture, and it calls us the beloved. That means we're loved of God. As God's chosen and elect, we must accept that he has done this in his love for us. That's why I was praying. Well, this passage caught me today, and I mean, I started singing that song. Who am I? Who am I that a king would come and die for? Who am I that uh, he would go to the cross and die for me? Why? Who would, who, why would he do that? Because he loves me. That's the only thing you can say. It's not because of anything I've done. It's all because of what he's done. He loves me. So uh, he loves us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. This is a good passage. It says, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love wherewith he hath loved us. 
Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Man, that, that's, not, that's just love all over those few verses. Amen? He loves us. He calls us. He puts us into Christ so that in the future, he can just shower us with all the goodness that he's going to shower on Christ. <clears throat> Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen? Amen. Whew. So we find these things. Now, he goes into these other things. Let's see. It says, if I'm the elect of God, wrapped in his holiness, and loved by his grace, then his spirit will produce these things, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. Let's walk through this real quick. First of all, the heart of mercy. This we, begin, we begin with the heart, amen? The heart. That's where we have to start, the heart of mercy. And that's where mercy has to come from. It can't come from anywhere else. It comes from the heart. Christ's mercy is shown in that he, with, he withholds the judgment we deserve as sinners. That's mercy. Amen? If, if you and I got what we deserved, woo, we'd be in trouble, right? Aren't you glad? In his mercy, he withholds what we deserve. Man. The world is, by and large, heartless and, me and mechanical. In our minds, we feel they deserve to be treated in the same manner they treat others. We have this retaliatory attitude as people. I, and it's inborn, you know. You, you, know, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you, you know. And if you don't hurt me, I'm going to hurt you first. That's kind of what it's almost gotten that bad. But it's like, it's like retaliatory. They have this idea. But mercy doesn't do that. You know, that's what's, that's what's cool about mercy. Mercy's going to say, no, I don't have to be that way. And that's why this heartless, mechanical world is such a great field for God's children who are clothed in this, this garment and they emit this mercy because it stands out. It's so unlike the world. The world just can't understand it. It just blows their minds that in some way we can have mercy instead of being angry or wanting to get back or revenge. You know what I'm saying? Now, let me read my note here. Now such a spirit is a very beautiful one. The Apostle Paul begins... The innermost of these garments with mercy. Then he moves to kindness. Kindness is an outward action of a heart of mercy. Think about it. Mercy is saying, I won't give you what you deserve. And kindness is saying, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. It's an action out of mercy. It's putting into physical practice the attitude of mercy. Doing good to all men, especially to the household of faith, the Bible tells us. Distributing to the necessities of the saints, it says. It's an, kindness is an action of a changed heart. A person gets saved, they get a new heart, right? And that heart is a heart full of mercy, and now it's going to take action by being kind. Kindness is something that's missing in the world, isn't it? You know, and if you show a little bit of kindness to somebody, people look at you like you're the strangest bird on the planet. What, what's wrong with you, you know? To tell somebody you appreciate them, to go out of your way, to, to say thank you, to, to hold the door for somebody. You know, just little things, and uh, you find it gone. So the heart, mercy, kindness. Then he says humbleness of mind. Now we move to the mind. Those who esteem others better than themselves, like Philippians says. Ascribing all they have and are to the grace of God, however God wants to use it. Doing works of mercy and righteousness without showing, without showiness or boasting of themselves. 
just being who they're supposed to be and humbly doing it, knowing that when they have done all they can, they are but unprofitable servants. And this is a beautiful garment for a believer to appear in. Be ye clothed in humility. You can't think about Jesus at the Last Supper without thinking about humility. The king of the universe, the creator of the world, takes a servant's garment and puts it on and kneels before his creation to wash their dirty feet. Yeah, even Judas, all of them. What an amazing act of servitude. Humble, humility. My daddy once told me, he said, son, he said, humility is that quality of a man that when he thinks he has it, he just lost it. That makes it tough to have humility in it. It just happens. And then meekness, another. And, and you know what? These terms we read and the world would say, y'all are a bunch of weaklings. This is a bunch of weakling stuff. Loving and mercy and kindness and yeah, yeah. Humil well, you're a bunch of sissies down there, you Christians. No, this is what makes us different, and this is what makes us more like our God. Amen? Right. Meekness. Meekness doesn't mean that you're a doormat. Meekness, I've said this over and over, is strength in control. Strength in control. The ability, like Jesus on the cross, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. That's meekness power and strength and yet he holds it in he holds back that's meekness the ability to patiently bear what god is pleased to lay on us able also to endure all the insults reproaches and indignities of men with a christ-like calmness who was that i'm thinking about i can't think now anyway so y'all probably got pictures of people that are like that. Doesn't, doesn't matter, nothing upsets them. They just don't, they're not going to let the outside world influence them to the place where they lose the calmness of spirit. They just they, they walk in it. And they, to do that, they've got to be long-suffering. Amen? This person patiently bears the evil words and actions of others and is not easily provoked to wrath by them. He puts up with injuries, many times being taken advantage of or mistreated by those who love him, who... Who, who, will, who say they love him and sit down contented instead to, be a, to, to offend uh, instead to offended with all that he has endured to take advantage of him to make fun of his, his seeming seeming, it's not true seeming weakness to take advantage of it he's long suffering, he takes it he endures it doesn't let it get to him. And then for bearing one another. This is not bearing one another's burdens. Although we are commended to do just that. But this is forbearing. It means to put up with the other's weaknesses. And not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing in, the word, in word or deed. Forbearing. It means to put up with it. Don't let it offend you. Don't let it get you under the skin. It is recognizing that we are all human and we all have weaknesses that can irritate others and letting God find in us a peaceable spirit to let it go. Forgiveness, and that's where we go next. And this is where it leads to forgiving one another. He gives the standard by which we are to forgive even as Christ forgave you. Also forgive. You know, there's a lot of things the Bible gives, God gives us as standards that we're to live by. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Oh, my goodness. There's just some days that's really difficult. Not with you, baby. Not with you. Some of our other men have problems with it. Just like that, you know, there's some standards God gives that just go way out there. And this is one of them. The Lord says, forgive as he's forgiven us. Forgiveness doesn't come easy for some people. In fact, most people. You know, you get hurt or offended. Somebody says something that makes you mad. It's hard to let it go. God says, let it go. Let it go. 
Be like Jesus on the cross. These people who've hurt you, they didn't drive nails through your hands, did they? They just said something. Jesus, they're driving nails through his hands. What did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know? Forgiving each other. And how? Well, he, he ends it up. He kind of sums it up. I love this, the way he puts it. The bond of perfection. It's bound in perfection. All of it has to be in love. The last bit of spiritual clothing seems to be given in order to tie it all up. Bound in perfection, this love. Above all, put on love, he says, charity. Every bit of everything that Christ has given us can be summed up with one word. Just love. Just love. Right? Love God. Love others. It's real simple. Jesus said that's all. If you just do two commands, that's all. Simple. In fact, to be honest with you, if you just do the first one, that you'll do the second one. If you love God the way you're supposed to, you'll love others the way you're supposed to. But it all wrapped around that one word, that little four-letter word, little V, love. We need love. Love should be the most visible quality of a Christian. Love. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4 real quick. We're going to read through this just real quick. And then I'll close. 1 John chapter 4. Beginning at verse 7. 1 John 4 and verse 7. I started out talking about Calvinism and how the Word of God is an answer to their theology. Here, again, we find God's Word, an answer, uh, a command, a... uh, a standard for us to live by. First John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. It's an indication that we are his children, that we love each other, that we love and care for each other. What did Jesus say about his disciples? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Amen. Verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So you can't say you know God and not love. It's got to be there. Verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son in the world that we might live through him. God demonstrated his love for us. I mean, you, God could not demonstrate his love any more than he did. You know? People say, I wish God would send some kind of sign to let me know that that I'm special or something. He did. 2,000 years ago, go back to the cross. Jesus came and died for you. How much more could you ask of him? Here in his love. Is that where I'm at? Here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Boy, is that the truth. And sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. You see, it's, it's not hard for us to love God because look what he's done for us. In fact, it almost should be expected that we love him. But what's amazing is that he loves us. That's what he's saying there. Here in his love, not that we love God, because we ought to all love God, but that he loved us and was willing to give us his son. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Love God, love others. Amen? It's all part of it. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. Oh, this is a good verse. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. You know what's interesting? He says, no man has ever seen God at any time. That's the truth. No man's ever seen. So how do men see God? Well, he tells you. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected. It's seen in us. That's how people see God. They see it in us. So then you come to the end of the day, you've got to ask the question, did people see God in me? The way I acted at the store, the way I responded to the cashier, the way I I acted towards my workmates today, did they see God in me? Did they see that love? Did they see that? They should. And if they didn't, get it right tomorrow. Amen? Get it right tomorrow. If we're the elect of God, we're wrapped in His holiness and loved by His grace then his spirit will produce certain fruit that the world would not be able to re- that the world would be able to recognize in us as God's children. 
If we are all that this says, it ought to be, we ought to stand out like sore thumbs to this old lost and dying world. Amen? All right, any question, comment, or thought? So set the microphone girl is ready to go. Anybody? Question, comment, or thought? Don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, sometimes I think you guys are afraid to ask questions. You think, oh, I don't want anybody to think I didn't know, or, you know. Whatever. There's probably five more people sitting around you don't know either, or would like to know, or would like to ask the question. Got Ruby's got a question, and she's giggling, so wait, we've got to get this online. Y'all see what I put up with. Okay, so you said that on the cross. Oh, I love it. When they start the question, or they say, you said. <laughs> you said uh, that when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's correct. Okay, so we are to forgive. Yes. But if they know what they're doing, do we still need to forgive yes. them? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. They were crucifying a man that was innocent. They knew exactly what they were doing. But, you know, here's the thing about that. Let me just say this about that. Just, I, I'm going to take off just a little bit on it. And it, it passed through my mind a while ago, and I didn't say it. If we had that mindset, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because when somebody accidentally or on purpose says something or does something to hurt you, they don't, many times they don't realize how it hurts or how deep it goes or how it may affect you. They don't have a clue. And so that's why we pray that way. Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I'm just going to forgive them because I know what I'm doing. And I'm going to just forgive them so I don't have to ha carry that load around with me. I tell you, that's the neat thing, too. You know, when you forgive somebody, you just dumped a load off. Amen? And it's a load they put on you. And you let them do that, and you carry it around for them. If you carry around a bitterness or an unforgiving spirit, all you're doing is carrying around a load that they put on you and they've done forgot about it. And you keep hauling it around. I'm mad at them because they did such and such. They didn't even thought of your name in the last month. So you're just carrying around their load. That's all you're doing. Just forgive them. Turn, get, turn loose. Or turn, here, I don't need that anymore. Carly, you have a question or comment? I don't remember exactly how he said it, but we were talking about the uh, chapter 13 and lo uh, love and mentioning a calm spirit. Mm -hmm. And immediately I thought of Betsy. Uh huh. Because I don't ever remember mm -mm. Betsy ever having, being uh, upset mm -mm. or disturbed. She was, and she was just, just a very calm. Yeah. Yeah. Loving person. Yeah. And you meet them. Some of you don't remember her or, or don't know her, but she was very special yeah. in our church. She was. And uh, you meet people all the time. I've met several that they have that. Sp you get around them and you just feel good. You go, oh, yeah. They, they'll take a conflict and they just go through it. Don't even get rattled. They, Rick, Rick Staples is like that. To me, he is. <laughs> I know. Joni just fell out up there. <laughs> but I've seen him, you know, around here we'll have a situation that's going bad. And it's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, we're going to fix it. Oh. Okay, well, okay. We're going to fix it. Patty, go ahead. Um, I learned this one a long time ago. It's brilliant. I didn't think of it, so don't credit me. But somebody said once, carrying around a grudge is swallowing poison and expecting the other guy to die. Yeah. But That's it doesn't good. kill him, it's going to kill you. That's right. And if you've ever lived or, or known somebody like that, yeah. it's true. It is true. It destroys them. Anybody else? Nope. I think that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Josette. You did a good job. All right, we're going to have choir practice, are we not? Yes.
So uh, we'll have choir practice. Stick around. If you want to sing in the choir, you're welcome to join in. Be a good time to get involved right now because they're working on their Easter cantata. So. All right, let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. You three can't sit together anymore. I know. They were good. They were good. That's why they did better. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for allowing us to come together to read your word, to study your word. Father, how plain and simple it was tonight. We just got to put it on. Put on meekness and put on humility and put on love and, 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 unforg- and forgiveness, Lord. We, we've got to put these things on. We, that's who we are supposed to be. Lord, let us be who we're supposed to be. Let people see us as the children of God, the way we're supposed to be. We love you and thank you, Lord, for these who are here. Go with us now the rest of the week. Bring us back safely Sunday. We look forward to your day in the house of the Lord Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.